Hi everyone, my name is Ben Bohr and I'm part of the Sloan Sports Analytics research paper team. And it's my pleasure to introduce our next paper. It's quality versus quantity, improved shot prediction in soccer using strategic features from spatiotemporal data. And here to present that is Patrick Lucy. And before we welcome him on stage, I want to tell you a little bit about um, the structure of today's talk. It's going to be about 20 minutes long and it will be followed by a five minute Q&A session. And so if you have any questions, please hold them till the end and raise your hand and I'll come over to you with the mic so everyone can hear your question. Um, so with that, please join me in welcoming Patrick Lucy. Right, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, my name's Patrick Lucy. I'm from Disney Research in Pittsburgh, and today I'm going to talk about some of the stuff we've been doing with tracking data in soccer. Uh, more specifically, we're going to see how we can use that data to estimate shots, uh, shot quality. So before I start, I, um, I'm going to introduce an example here. So hopefully there's no Brazilians here, because the next couple of minutes could be quite painful. Uh, so the game I'm talking about is a semi-final from the World Cup last year. Uh, Germany won 7-1. So I hadn't seen such a dominant performance before. It's kind of shocking. Um, but being a stats guy, I wanted to look at the stats a bit deeper. And there's a couple of interesting things that I noted. First of all, on the FIFA website, they had some pretty cool stats. Uh, so dangerous attacks, deliveries in the penalty area, and Brazil had a lot more. And if we kind of drill down to the shots, Brazil actually had more shots than Germany, so 18 to 14. And I was like, well, how's that? You know, I watched the game, Germany absolutely dominated. Um, so what I did is actually I cut some tape, I got, I, I got the video, and then I thought, right, let's see the quality of chances. So what I did is I put a spectrum up. And so I said, there's low probability, there's high probability. So people who watch football, we kind of know that, okay? And so I just went through each shot. And then um, essentially what I did, so, so we have the first example here, uh, we have Marcelo, gets the ball on top of the box, and he has a shot. So he's a fair distance out, so basically I said, well, that's, you know, that has a low probability of going in. Um, and then we have the next example. We have Oscar. So he has, uh, he, he, he's in a good position here, but you can see the Germans shut him down really, really effectively. So two defenders there, likelihood of getting a goal in that situation is pretty low. Okay? Then we have a, uh, an example from the second half. So we have Oscar again. You know, that's a golden, you know, that's a golden opportunity there. So I said, well, that's a pretty good chance. So I'll mark that. And so essentially I did that for 18 shots and we kind of built this distribution on the spectrum. And we can see a lot of the chances that Brazil had were kind of on the lower end there. And so then I looked at the Germany chances. So here we have the first goal. Um, so somehow Thomas Muller got free. You know, that's criminal. What was Louise doing there? It's, um, so I said, well, that's a pretty good chance. So we just marked it there. And then uh, we had the, the, uh, the second goal here. So some poor defending. Uh, ball just kind of rolls into the, in, into the penalty box. Close has a shot, has another shot. So those were pretty good chances. So I marked it accordingly. Then we had the third goal. And um, it's pretty impressive, this one. So ball comes across. And Tony Cruz hits an absolute stunner. So I said, likelihood of that going in is pretty low, though. You know, that's a reason why it was a really good goal. And then straight from the kickoff, we had, a, um, we had this occur. So straight from the kickoff, there's a, he dispossesses. You see this in under sevens. The ball comes back, open goal, you know, 4-0. Um, so essentially, I did that for all the shots. And again, we build up this distribution. And Germany had a lot of better shots. So... And so if we look at the distribution, you know, we can see it's skewed one way or the other. And so the question that we had is that how can we do this from tracking data? Because I did this myself, very, very subjective. So my opinion, my bias, my experience deviates it one way or the other. So wouldn't it be better if we could learn this directly from data? And that's essentially what this paper is about. So it's about essentially the goal that we had is estimating the shock the shot quality from tracking data. And people have done this before, but they've only used ball event data. And so what's different about this work is that we're encoding it from tracking data because defender distance, goalkeeper location is really important. So we have a nice collaboration with Prozone. Uh, so the season that we analyzed is of a recent top tier 
uh, league. Uh, I can't disclose the identity of the league or, or, the, or, or the teams. And from the league we analyzed, there's around about 10,000 shots, and we analyzed the 10 second window before the shot occurred. And the challenge that we had is basically, how do we get a computer to understand this? How do we encode this information? Uh, and, and, and basically the pipeline is we have the tracking data, we extract some features, and then we just fit a classifier. So logistic regression is, 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 is a good method to use here. But the secret source which makes this work is actually crafting these features. And so this is just expected goal value. So people have done it in basketball, they've done it in soccer as well. But essentially what it means, given a shot, we want a probability between 0 and 1 whether it's going to be a goal or not. And so essentially the baseline is from the season that we analysed, 9.6% of all shots ended up as a goal. So meaning that, um, so, so, so have a nice plot. So essentially we have this spectrum and it's to the lower end, which makes sense. Most of the shots don't end up in a goal. And how do we actually evaluate it? So we have these parameters. So we have the outcome. We know it's a goal or not. So it's just binary, zero or one. But actually our prediction is a continuous value. It's between, um, it, it's, yeah, so it's a continuous value between zero and one. And essentially we can just calculate the error. And so to, just to give you an insight into what that means is that just say we set the probability, regardless of position, context, just say we set the probability of each shot at 9.6%. If we look at the error, you can see the big error, the, there's a big peak around 10%. Uh, so that's the error, so because most shots don't end up in a goal, so the error is kind of minimal. But we have this peak down 90% because we do have goals. And it's very, um, this is not ideal because there's so much disparity here. So essentially we want to minimise that. So the average error we can calculate as 0.1745. But if we incorporate match context, we can do a better job. So we have in play, so just normal play, continuous play. And so the expected goal value is around about 10.6%. And for all these visualisations, we have the red team attacking left to right, the blue team uh, defending right to left, and the green markers there denote the ball actions. And so we have stoppages as well. So if we have normal play, we have stoppages and penalties, you know. And the season that we analysed, 71.3% of all penalties ended up in a goal. So that's contextual information we should use in our model. Uh, on, on, on the flip side, we have free kicks. So from the season we analysed, only 5% of free kicks, direct free kicks, ended up in a goal. And then we have corners. Uh, so 9% of all shots from corners ended up in a goal. That's a bit misleading because the number of shots you actually get from a corner is really low. So there's been a lot of work being done in this area the last uh, couple of years. I'm not going to talk about it too much. And so we have set pieces. So set piece, which I've defined here in this paper, is basically we have a foul and then there's a free kick and it's not a direct shot and goal. Okay? I know set pieces can be used to describe all of that, but for this paper, I've just defined it as, that as a set piece. Okay, so now we have normal play. So 75, 80% of the time, you know, shots occur in, uh, in this context. But again, you watch the game, you know there's different variations in, 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 in this category. So we have open play, which I've defined as just uh, players playing around on the 18-yard box, and then we have a counter-attack, a counter-attack or a, a fast break. So in a counter-attack or a fast break, 15% of shots end up in a goal compared to just normal play. And that makes sense, right, because it's all contingent on space, and that's how you get more space. Um, and so... It, Essentially, we have all, it's basically multimodal. We have all these different uh, contexts. And essentially, we should fit a classifier to each of these contexts. So that's basically the message in this paper. And the breakdown in the season that we analysed is that 66% you know, of the shots we analysed happened in open play. We're in about 11% counterattack, 11% corners, and uh, the other categories are a bit lower. And what's interesting in terms of the error is that if we include um, the match context, we reduce that peak down uh, at 90%. And you say, well, so what, Patrick? That's really interesting. But what about location? Um, so location is very important. So essentially, I've plotted a heat map here of all the shots. So that's on the left. And then we have a heat map of where the actual goals occur. And surprise, surprise, if you're closer to the goal, you're more likely to uh, get a goal. And so essentially, so that can improve our probability, okay? And a way that we can model that is just using logistic regression, and I think this is just a nice way to explain it. Uh, so just so we, we randomly sample some examples, 
Uh, we have goals, which we've denoted there in green, so their, their classification is one. And then we have a lot of shots which don't end up in a goal. And then on the x-axis, we actually have distance from the goal there. So the way that we can model it, we can just fit a line. We just use linear regression. But that doesn't bound it between 0 and 1. So what we do, we just use logistic regression, which fits a sigmoid. And then we can basically get a value that way. So that's why we use logistic regression in this paper. And because context is so important, instead of just having one logistic regressor, or one regressor for all the circumstances, the variation is just too big. What we have to do, again, is fit a separate regressor for each of these contexts. Okay? So doing that gave us much better performance. So if we look at the error, uh, when we do that, you can see it's really, really smooth now. We've lost that peak down at 90%, and most of it shifted towards zero. That shows that we're actually doing something useful here. And so the average error drops down again. OK, so defender proximity is very important too. And so the question is, how can we encode that using uh, just a simple descriptor? So what we did is just we, uh, we got an area between the goal and where the ball handler was. And then we used point and polygon to see if a player was actually in that shaded region. And if a, player if a defender was in that region, we said, well, that player was goal side. OK? And then, uh, alternatively, we have uh, when no defender was within, within that area, uh, they, they weren't goal side. And so the breakdown in percentages is interesting when a player is goal side and when a player isn't goal side. So in open play, it's around about 7.5%. And then when a player is not goal side, it's about, um, sorry, when a player is goal side, it's 7.5%. When a player isn't goal side, it's around about 11.5%. And uh, that's even heightened for counterattacks. So, Again, we have more context. We can actually do better predictions. OK? And so uh, actions. Actions play a very important role. So the prediction error dropped a little bit there, but a lot of these things co-vary. OK? Um, and so other features that we encoded uh, were the actions. So actions play a very important role here. So essentially we, essentially we have if a player passed um, or dribbled, um, also, the goalkeeper location or, or, or across is very important. And also, we include dynamics, so we get the, the team motion. And so I'm going to talk about something we, we did using uh, formations later on, and that improves our performance as well. So again, just validation, you know, using all this, all this information, we can actually do a better prediction. That's basically the takeaway message here. And so given that we can model, we can do better predictions by incorporating more match context, surely if we find more of these contexts, we can do better prediction. But this is an unsupervised way. So what we showed here is what we did supervised. So we labeled all these game situations. But we want to find this in an unsupervised way. And the big question is, how do we cluster tracking data? Players switch position all the time. And um, so a nice visualization which describes this is, uh, is here. So essentially, we have players, and this is their starting position. So each starting position uh, at the start of the 10 seconds before a shot happened. Uh, so each player, so left back is a particular color, uh, left center back is a particular color. We can see at the start of these players before a shot, it's basically random. These players move around all the time. So we've done a lot of work in this area in the last year, and essentially what we need to do is align the data. Okay? Once we align the data, essentially we get these nice formations that pop out. Okay? I'm not going to talk about this too much, but that essentially allows us to cluster tracking data, because this is a bottleneck. Okay? And so once we do that, so we found just clustering, uh, we just used k-means, and we clustered using 10 clusters. That further reduced our, uh, our error down, down below 0.14. OK, so that basically validates what we did. But essentially, what you want to see is, so, well, does it actually work? So can I see some examples? So we have an example here where we have the, the red team attacking left to right. So we have the left winger with the ball. He runs down the left wing, gets the ball, drives into the box, puts the ball across the front of goal to a player on the back stick. And so we class that as 71%. And that kind of makes sense, right? Um, and similarly, we have another fast break, uh, play drives in the box, another cross uh, in, in front of the goal, and we uh, got a probability of around 53% there. Again, it, it, it passed the gut check for me anyway. Um, another situation here, we had a free kick. Uh, it was parried by the goalkeeper. It was deflected uh, to uh, another attacker who was just waiting there. 
and around about 50%. So if you think that a penalty was around about 70%, you know, this kind of resonates with that, you know, really, really good chances. And then so we have some poor chances here, um, you know, just shots uh, from well outside the box, so around about 4%. You know, 4%. So it, it, it does something reasonable. So now this is interesting. So we, got, we, so we can actually do some uh, analysis in terms of teams. So we want to see how efficient they are when they're attacking. So uh, two things I want to highlight here. So we have Team H. So they actually scored 71 goals, but their expected goal value is 57. And they happened to, they happened to win that league that year. Um, and surprise, surprise, they probably have the best strikers. So in those situations, these strikers are really good. They're probably going to be more efficient than the other players. And so we have Team K there. They actually only scored 26 goals, but their expected goal value was 36. OK, so it probably suggests their strikers aren't as good as the league average. Uh, defensively, this is interesting. I think we have a metric now to measure goalkeepers. OK, so we have Team T. They conceded 64 goals, but they only should have conceded 49. OK, so if I'm the manager of that team, I'd be going, um, maybe we look at having another goalkeeper for next season. Um, and so we can drill down to specific context as well. So we have open play. We can just see the efficiency there. So two things I wanted to note here is that we have Team H. Um, so they actually scored 39 goals, but their expected goal value is around 27. So Maybe they're efficient in that phase of the game. Uh, also, we have um, the defence. So we have Team I here. So uh, they actually conceded 38 goals, but the expected goal value is 26. So um, you know, similarly, we can do this for counter-attacks. Uh, there's not anything really interesting going on with offence, but in terms of the defence here, we have Team T. Uh, they conceded 16 goals, but expected goal value suggests they should only have conceded 11. And then also uh, Team J. So they conceded 14, but they probably should only have conceded nine. Now, I find this really interesting. So given this, we have a better way to tell stories in matches. OK, so I have a couple of examples here which I think are really interesting. So we have Team M versus Team S. Team S won 3-0. OK, so if we look at the stats, they had less possession um, and they had less shots. If we look at the expected goal value, the expected goal value is close to three compared to Team N who had more shots, but it was only one and a half. So that basically suggests, hey, Team S probably should have won that. They were dominant. And then we have another example here of a draw. So Team F is playing Team N. Um, and so essentially it was nil all. And so if we look at the stats, Team F actually dominated Team N. It, it appears in terms of possession. And they had a lot more shots. So let's actually look at the expected goal value. Well. Team F did dominate. So Team N, even though they had five shots, you know, they weren't good shots. So that would suggest that Team F you know, could feel aggrieved. You know, they did dominate that game. And then the last example I have here is Team I versus Team O. Okay? So that was a 3-0 um, was a 3-0 win for Team O. And so essentially let's look at the stats again. So Team O only had 34% possession, uh, had less shots. Let's see if they deserve to win. So Using the expected goal value, it's, it's a lot lower than um, Team I. So using this measure, we can actually, um, actually understand the game a bit better. And so that's basically the goal behind this work. So um, hopefully I've convinced you of the, um, the merit of this approach. So that basically sums it up. And so if you have any um, takeaway messages here, it's goal scoring is random, but not as much as you think. You know, as humans, we're really good at doing that. So essentially, we want to encode that intelligence into a computer system. Um, all these factors, location, defense, and actions are very important. But the secret source, again, is, can, is getting this context. Okay? We need to learn a classifier for each particular context. And by doing that, we can actually reduce the, uh, the error. Um, and this is really exciting, because now we can quantify team behaviors in terms of efficiency. Um, so Dean Oliver's done a lot of great work in, um, if everyone's read Basketball on Paper, you have these measures. So I think we can start to do this with soccer. Um, and also, in terms of metrics, I think we can value strikers and goalkeepers. And maybe we can compare different leagues, players in different leagues. What would they do in this situation? So I think this is really exciting. And again, you know, bet, uh, it leads to better uh, storytelling. Um, so all these great things I, I, I think we can do in the world of soccer analytics. So, but that's just my opinion. So, um, 
So thank you very much. So if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer that. So thank you. Raise your hand and we'll get a question for you. Here we are. So this seems like a fantastic way to explain kind of why certain goals or, or shots, I should say, are more likely to score and why others aren't. I'm curious if you're able to do any kind of predictive analysis to suggest that strikers on teams that are overperforming their expected goals, are they able to continue to do so into the future? Or is that something that tends to regress to the mean? That's a very, very good question. So I think the analysis which we've done here is very interesting, but I think we want to find out how teams create space to get these situations. So I think if you can drill down to those specifics, you can see how a striker would perform in that situation. So it, it has to do with train test mismatch. So if a striker has not been in a situation before, it's very hard to evaluate, but maybe you can simulate and maybe forecast and you know, drill down to that specific question. Hi, I know obviously you couldn't get any adjusted R squared or P values with the model you used, but did, did, were you able to calculate any uh, pseudo R squared or pseudo P values? Yeah, so uh, it's a good question. So we didn't put any P value in the presentation. Uh, the error is non parametric, so we couldn't do a T test, so we used the Wilcoxian, um, the, the Wilcoxian non parametric test, and so all of this was um, significant, so at 0 0.0001 level. Yeah, that's a good question. Hi, um, going back to the beginning, to the Brazil-Germany, do you have the expected uh, final score I for that do, game? I do, actually. So, um, so the expected goal value was 4.22, so I didn't have the tracking data for that. So I have an interface where I can actually draw the plays, so we're just matching trajectories. So the expected, go it's just an estimate, so the expected goal values uh, for Brazil was 4.2, that uh, no, was 2.2, for Germany it was 4.2. In your uh, logistic regression, did you include any variables to measure the players involved, either the shooters, goalkeepers, or defenders? That's a very good question. So you're talking about personalization. So we haven't incorporated any individual identity there. Uh, so we had a paper at uh, International Conference of Data Mining last year where, where we did for basketball. So we just uh, used non-negative matrix factorization to model the tendencies of each player in that situation. So that's exactly, well, I'm not going to disclose too much, but we're going along that angle. Yeah, that's a very good question. Yep. Uh, I think your approach of using context is uh, very useful. Uh, I was just wondering uh, whether you looked at the players, uh, you know, some players are both sided, they kick well both yep. sides, because, uh, you know, if you're on one side of the goal, but uh, if you are two-footed, then you have a slightly better chance of tricking and so on. That's a very, very good question. So essentially, it goes to the granularity of the data. So we have tracking data. That gives us a center of mass. Uh, the data that we have doesn't contain any more information in terms of who kicked the uh, left foot or right foot. All these variations, uh, which we actually don't have in the data. But uh, if we had that, you know, if a ball's in the air or if it's a difficult volley, you know, obviously that's going to change the percentages. But currently, we just didn't have that data. But so that's a very good question. If we had that, that's another contextual feature that we can use in doing better prediction. Hi, thanks for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I wonder uh, if you've looked at using expected uh, goal value to predict the outcome of the match and how good of a classifier it is uh, if you just sum up the expected yes. goal value. Yes, so, um, yes, so we, uh, we are looking at that, yeah. So, yeah, so that's just a very, very strong signal which could uh, hopefully help us do better match prediction. Yeah. Okay, so this will be our last question. Um, in terms of uh, any context, did you put in the time of the game at all? Like if they're more likely to score in the last 10 minutes in a certain location? No, 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 we didn't do that in the current model. Uh, so we did it uh, independent of match score, time left, um, home and away those factors, but given more data, so we did have a season, 10,000 shots, but really that's not that much. So my big goal is getting 10,000 hours worth of this data and then we can actually factor down, you know, essentially we want to emulate a human expert, so we need a lot more data to do that, but uh, given that, we'd like to do that more. So basically seeing how a, a player performs in clutch, uh, clutch situations and things like that. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Patrick Lucy.